I want to introduce Jelena, who is a student with Julia Hynexius, um, who will be introducing uh, Thea Query Tagle. All right. Thank you, Shaw. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jelena Macias. I'm a student in the program Shaped by the Sea, Shaped by the Hand marine biology and 3D art. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Thea Kirai Tagle to you all. Thea Kirai Tagle is a curator, writer, and an assistant professor of ethics studies and gender and sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Today, Dr. Tagle will talk about her exhibition, Afterlife, We Survive, the themes include how artists can help us uh, envision more just futures for our BIPOC and LGBTQ communities in the midst of ecological collapse. Dr. Tagle's writing on Filipinx, American contemporary art, visual cultures of violence, grassroots activism, and speculative features in the expand expanded Pacific Rim can be found in scholarly popular venues like ASAPJ, American and Hyperallergic. Last quarter, my program had the opportunity to read several of Dr. Togley's essays, including one published on Hyperallergic called Who Profits from Waste? This article inspired a lively seminar conversation where we discuss the line between art and trash, good and bad recycling. Uh, the passion that Dr. Tagle puts into her writing and curatorial work is contagious. And I'm excited to hear about the artists that have contributed their work to the exhibition we'll be hearing about today, especially with the way we're distanced now, the way that uh, Dr. Tagle connects communities is so important. Um, so for everyone attending today, I would like to welcome Thea Kirai Tagle. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jelena. That was a really lovely introduction. And, and thank you, Shaw, for, for opening up the space. And, you know, thanks to all of you who are calling in uh, on a, it's Wednesday, yeah? A Wednesday morning uh, to hear me talk a little bit about curating this, the show, Afterlife. Um, so, so yeah, thanks, thanks all around. Um, just wanted to begin by, you know, saying a, a little bit again about who I am and where I stand or I'm sitting, right? Uh, since this is a virtual background and I could be anywhere. Um, so as Jelena said, my name's uh, Thea Kirai Tagle. I hold a PhD in ethnic studies from UC San Diego and I'm currently an assistant professor in ethnic studies and gender and sexuality studies at UMass Boston. Um, Technically, I am currently uh, sitting and sited in Rematu Shaloni land, otherwise known as San Francisco, uh, where, you know, during COVID uh, pandemic, I have been in quarantine after spending the first part of 2020 back in Seattle, where I lived for the last four years before that, um, and where I was able to meet amazing folks like your professor, Julia Hanexius. Um, I'm a queer Filipinx femme. Um, and I've had many diasporic homes over the course of my life and, you know, my own position and my travels and the relationships I've made across place and space and time uh, really continue to impact the work that I do, not just in my writing and the ethics and the things that I'm, I'm passionate about, um, but also how I come to, to curating artists and working with them in shows like Afterlife, which I'll be talking uh, the most about today. So, um, just to begin by giving you some images of the show. And actually there's two versions of Afterlife. So I'll talk first about the one in Seattle before uh, delving into the most recent iteration, which is here in San Francisco and online. Um, you know, the show Afterlife that I carried again, which has two iterations for me, um, even before the events of 2020, Right? I have been consumed by this question of what can art and performance really do right, to help move us collectively, socially, politically, uh, to work together um, towards really radical and transformative social change. 
right? And when I'm thinking about transformative social change, I don't know what that looks like, but I do know, right, the society and the life that I want to be part of is one in which Black, Indigenous, queer, Brown, and trans folks, where all of us can actually survive and more than survive, can actually thrive. And so the crux of the show and of my work in general is always centered on this question of survival and, and thriving. So a little bit about afterlife. The first exhibition was presented in June and July 2018 in Seattle at the Alice. It had five artists of Asian Pacific American descent. So Asian diasporic artists, um, Pacific Islander artists, as well as artists from the Philippines. Um, and in this initial presentation of Afterlife, uh, We Survive, um, you know, it was a labor of love. There was five artists whose names are here. Um, and the show was one that, you know, came together with the work of a group of uh, artists and curators. So the Alice was a collaboratively run space. Uh, Julia Hanexis and myself were two out of the seven curators. Um, and that's how we actually uh, built our relationship together. And the question that really drove this particular show, um, and we can talk more about, right, this show um, was, was this, right? What new strategies are needed to survive environmental catastrophe, and military intervention by communities and specifically communities of color, indigenous communities facing displacement and dispossession? And moreover, how can speculation, humor and fantasy fuel larger movements for social change around the Pacific Rim from the Northwest to California to Southeast um, Asia and in the heartland of the US. Um, and that first show was again, really brought about not by a specific political event, although this came you know, shortly after the 2016 presidential election, but by a larger set of questions of what does it mean, right? To be a BIPOC person uh, living in the Pacific Northwest where I was at the time in Seattle. Um, uh, how do we respond, right? How do we live differently? So we are not so extractive and violent towards the earth and, and towards one another. Um, and a little bit briefly, again, before we get more in depth about it, the second version of the show, Afterlife We Survive, um, is currently open at the San Francisco Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. It's uh, up through February 7th in person, and it's able to be viewed in person because it was transformed um, uh, at the very last minute, really, before it opened in November, to a fully accessible public outdoor show um, that could be viewed right by walking, can be viewed by walking outside of the building as well as uh, online, right? With a full online expansion. So this version of the show is much larger than the initial. We went from initial five artists from the Seattle show to 11 uh, individual artists and artist collectives. So it's about 20 artists uh, total. And if you work with artists, you know, 20 is not that many, but it's also so many. <laughs> okay, so we went to a much more expanded presentation. Um, and it was one that was in this case of 2020, really incredibly shaped, um, not just in conception, but also in presentation by the events of the pandemic, shutting all of our lives down um, by wildfires that have ravaged uh, up and down the West Coast and in particular California throughout the summer and in the fall. Um, as well as you know, the summer and ongoingness right, of race rebellion and riot um, in, in the US, right? So all of these conditions have radically shaped, again, these kinds of questions that I'm still interested in survival and thriving and what it means to be a person of color, an indigenous person uh, or a member of the queer and trans community, right? How do we, how do we live and how do we live well uh, with one another? Um, and so before I delve a little bit more deeply into the specific kinds of um, threads or questions around the show um, and what I hope, right, uh, we can all take from uh, the artists in terms of what their imaginaries are and what their hopes are, right, for all of us collectively. Um, I actually wanted to take it really quickly, a step back um, to give you all a sense of my process as a curator and what really drove me to begin curating um, shows that were considering questions of climate collapse, political collapse, uh, political violence of multiple kinds. And again, um, to wanting to curate work uh, that featured artists who were imagining and otherwise, 
imagining, right? Either a speculative future that we could work towards or a re-envisioning of the world that we currently live in. Um, you know, why I felt so driven, right? To curate artists like that into, again, these kinds of publicly facing shows. So the first uh, moment of, you know, beginning to percolate around these ideas actually came from returning to the Philippines after some time away in 2017. And I lived there as a child and only sporadically, right? Every five, 10 years or so, am I able to, to go back um, and visit family? So on my last visit in 2017, um, to Manila in particular, as well as to Davao, which is one of the Southern Islands and one of the Southern Islands of the Philippine archipelago, um, I was really witness to a sea change that has been happening in the country since the election of um, President Rodrigo Duterte, um, who was democratically elected, but essentially has been operating as a strong arm authoritarian leader. Um, one of the major things that Duterte has done since his election in 2017 um, is to, you know, create bans of all kinds for things that are more banal perhaps like smoking and then more major um, like the war on drugs. What the war on drugs in the Philippines has resulted in is over 23,000 civilian casualties, um, mass killing um, by the police and by extrajudicial military of innocent Filipino people, many of them poor and transient folks under the guise of anti-terror and anti-war on drugs. Right. Um, it has been incredibly awful uh, to see this. It has been documented by photojournalists around the world um, and very little right, has been done to actually right, push back against this authoritarian regime. So it was really intense to see, right, again, the ways that lives were being rendered as unvaluable right, because they had addiction um, and you know, to be in a space. Right, where it was so clear, right, whose lives mattered and whose, whose did not really deeply affected me. The second thing that really shaped my wanting to curate a show called Afterlife We Survive was another trip that I was privileged enough to take in 2018, spring 2018, to Hawaii's Big Island, where I'd been several times before. Um, and on this particular trip, I drove down to a place called South Point. Um, which is, you know, marketed as the southernmost point of the American territories, right, on the equator. Um, it's the southernmost point on the Big Island. And in this place, which is literally in the middle of nowhere, there's not um, much human habitation, right, because it's so far south, the winds are really intense, the water is really intense. Um, and as I'm walking through this place, I come across this black lava beach, and in it are thousands and thousands of microplastics. Right, things that have been washed up from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, onto the beach and are littering it. Um, it's a now you know, famous beach for people that, I don't know, want to go see um, environmental catastrophe, <laughs> um, but it's Camillo Beach, right? Um, and again, microplastics from the Pacific uh, Garbage Patch and things like this, which is a, a bundle of fishing wires, fishing uh, rope, right, wash up regularly on this beach. Um, and that was a really intense, you know, this is a really sublime um, scape, right, landscape, seascape. Again, nothing is here, except everything is here. All of our waste, all of our trash, all of the things that people from around the world, from the US West Coast, especially in Southeast Asia and China, right, all of our trash ends up back on these pristine Pacific islands. And again, that was a really intense moment to, to witness and reminded me and made me think of the necessity, right, of um, using aesthetics, right, because all these images I'm showing you are of violence, but also very aesthetically arresting in a way, right. Um, in my role as a curator and as an art writer and as a professor of ethnic studies, um, it really, you know, drove me, <laughs> these moments drove me to um, think about ways uh, aesthetics um, can operate as a form of soft power to helping people um, like you all today, right? Um, think differently about the intersections of climate collapse, uh, political violence, um, and how communities of color, especially indigenous communities and queer communities have really borne the burden and the brunt um, of all of these, right? Confluences of, of violence. 
So a little bit about afterlife, what remains, right? And I wanted to spend most of the time today talking about the current show YBCA. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. And if you have questions about any of these artists or artworks, please ask in the QA, Q and A. So the first time, again, just a few months, really after I came back from both the Philippines and from uh, the Big Island of Hawaii, I had the opportunity uh, through the Alice and our curatorial um, group to put together Afterlife What Remains uh, in our 700 square foot gallery. And again, it had five artists. Uh, one was a collective of three, um, but a total list of five artists and collectives whose work um, I really thought could help us, right? Um, move through questions of climate grief and also reflection again of the ways that people in the local state as well as global context, right? We're living and surviving. Um, and for me, a key part of doing this work as a labor of love um, with a small group of other curators who like Julia Hanexis, who really helped me with this uh, was to make poetic connections. So what you're seeing in some of these images are installation shots, right? That are showing some of the artwork, but the text next to it um, is the wall text. And for me, the work of pairing more poetic, perhaps um, quotes from other thinkers, artists, um, scholars like Jack Derrida and uh, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang um, around questions of survival and resilience would be much more helpful ways, right? I think for folks to um, apprehend the artworks more so than a straight up description, right? Of what we're seeing um, in each one of these pieces. And my hope was um, as we went through, oops, um, as folks are able to move through the gallery or attend one of the two uh, public programs, we had a film screening as well as a haunting uh, by the Super Features Haunt Collective. Um, my hope was that people who move through the space could really dwell and meditate um, with works that forced you to pay attention longer, stay longer. Um, this slide right now is of Rhea Tajiri's beautiful film, Lordville, which is a full length film. Right, so it is demanding and asking for people's attention. My hope was that for folks to enter into this very small space, to spend and to linger longer um, with artists whose work again was helping us think through survival um, after being wasted, um, being made into waste, uh, would force us to slow down, would force us to again, think ethically, think differently about not only our own impact, right? On, uh, recycling and pollution on a personal level, um, but really how we all are in different ways um, also affected by similar structures of violence or are complicit, right? Um, in allowing uh, some forms of anti-Indigenous, um, anti-Black, anti-environment violence to, to continue. So those are just a couple of the images. And again, I'm sorry, I can't talk about it more in depth now, but I'm really happy to get Q&A in the later portion. So for the rest of the time, I wanted us to take a look at Afterlife We Survive, which is the current presentation up at the Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco. It was always my hope after the first presentation at the Alice in Seattle that afterlife would have multiple lives and that it would look different um, and was responsive to the place in which it was shown and made. Um, so some of the artists in the first iteration in Seattle had ties to the Pacific Northwest um, and some of the key images such as those by Super Futures Haunt Collective um, were actually shot and staged by those artists um, on uh, the Pacific uh, Northwest Coast. So some of those earlier images that you saw of folks in masks on the beach and the haunting itself, the live performance, Angie Morell of Super Futures is, uh, her family is from the Klamath people. Um, and so their hauntings, right, intentionally bring up different histories of indigenous survival and survivance, both around the Portland and Oregon area, um, as well as uh, making ties to different Duwamish communities in Seattle. So for the second presentation uh, in San Francisco, it was similarly important uh, to expand the scope and the scale of the show um, to reflect um, and to consider particular issues um, around, again, ecological violence, political violence happening in uh, 
California writ large and the San Francisco Bay Area um, in particular. And so here are some of the you know, guiding questions that you're seeing on the right, which is what I pitched YBCA with. There was an open call uh, last year that I pitched for, and this is what I used. I intentionally expanded the show for YBCA to include and account for lives, issues, and practices of more communities of color. So expanding it from a focus on Asian Pacific Islander communities in the first show to really thinking about Black, Latinx, um, indigenous and queer artists um, and communities, especially those I had made uh, ties with um, in my time of living in the Bay previously. Um, it was also really important for me to bring in artists and throughout my curatorial projects, also really important for me to bring in artists um, whose work I feel is underwritten about, not represented. Um, you know, Rhea Tajiri, for example, is a legend in Asian American cinema, but and is you know, farther along in her career, but I think is criminally underrated. On the flip side, you have artists like Art25, whose image you're seeing in this image, um, you know, that I think more people need to hear about. Um, and yeah, it was also really important for me, again, to draw on different connections with communities I had made over time to incorporate their work into a much larger uh, presentation. So this was uh, the initial call was for a show, a much smaller show that was going to be on the upstairs of YBCA's second floor galleries. So about 3000 square feet. And then in March, as you all know, 2020, everything shut down um, <laughs> and couldn't do it. We were on hold indefinitely um, without any kind of plan um, as to what we would do. I thought it was put on ice. Um, then come August, after about six months of, you know, the world, me, <laughs> the artists, um, not knowing what we were doing personally, let alone with a show, um, we were asked by the Yerbuena Center to transform the show into a fully publicly available uh, presentation. So what you're seeing now are these installation shots, which we turned around, um, and I'm really proud and you know of having artists trust me <laughs> to to go along with this um, in the span of less than two months really all 11 artists and art collectives agreed to transforming their work from an indoor show at a very different scale to a much larger outdoor presentation and the artists in the show um you know like me, many of them, you know, share these concerns, not just with ecological violence and again, different forms of survival, which their work touches on, um, but really wanted to speak to this moment, right? Of race rebellion and riot in the wake of police killings of young black men, women, and non-binary folks, um, as well as to the conditions of ongoing wildfire that many of our artists were personally affected by in uh, California at the time. And, you know, there was five main themes of the show and we can talk more about it again when uh, wonderful Julia Hanexis pops on the video for our one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight, right, really quickly some of the, the themes that I thought brought together the different artists to do this work. Um, it was really important, again, to bring in artists that I think are underrepresented, not talked about, um, as well as artists that I have a personal, um, more personal relationship with and know, right, through our own conversations that they're really thinking about the complexities of race, of place, of space, um, and of environment in ways that are not just didactic, but that ask people to think really expansively about what justice can look like, um, what worlds uh, we want to see. So this is the work of Courtney Morris. Um, this is the work of Misha Cardenas. And what you're seeing here are not just installation images, but also process images of, you know, what I pitched to the artists and then to YBCA when they asked us to transform this show um, really at the last minute. <laughs> okay, so this is, you know, my bad Photoshop job of what Misha Cardenas's handheld playable game that you can download right now on your iPhone or iPad and play yourself outside. What an AR video game could look like when it was projected large on the side of a building. 
um, and what it could do, again, to help people move through and think through, in this case, what it's like for a trans Latinx woman to be living through the wildfires and to be trying to escape from wildfires, which is the experience that you go through when you are playing uh, Sin Sol, uh, Misha Cardenas's uh, augmented reality video game, which is now projected again every night on the outside of the YBCA building. Um, the artists, again, really trusted me <laughs> to move things, even work that was meant to be socially engaged projects, like 5050s project that you're seeing here that's usually shown inside a gallery that incorporates a lot of conversations about people's memories of sea level rise. Um, again, it's through trust and through building real relation. Um, I take that work of curation based into care uh, really seriously, right? I'm not a curator of individual artworks. I don't work for a gallery or a museum in that way to steward artworks. But what I do do is I steward relationship. And if we are thinking differently about transformative justice and right relationship for Black, Indigenous, queer, and trans folks, I think a really key work um, that curators can do is actually shift the forms of how we work, right? How we work with other artists, how we work with other communities. Um, so it's not so exploitative and extractive. And again, I'm happy to talk more about that um, with you all in the Q&A and with Julia Hanexis. It was also important in terms of access to the show, um, especially for artists like 5050 who are inviting participation to think about access in a multitude of ways. So public access in terms of people now being able to see things safely and socially distant. So right, with masks, um, keeping appropriate distance, as well as in terms of um, access through language. So this is a 5050s project which they had translated into the four primary languages of the city of San Francisco, Spanish, Tagalog, and Chinese. Part of it was also thinking about different ways that, right, folks of different abilities could access the work. Um, both online and in person, right? How can we actually shift text or shift presentation material so that even if folks were seeing things from behind windows and behind screens, right? Um, people could still engage. Um, and so that again was another really important part of not just showing, right? How artists are thinking about survival and survivance after collapse, but of actually doing and modeling what that could look like. Right? How could, through the process of this show, right, we actually think about different ways right, of asking audiences to engage, to engage with the work of artists of color, to engage with each other, to engage with technology, again, with this larger goal of envisioning social justice. Um, one of the key themes of both shows, and I'm going to, I think, end here um, so I can talk to Julia. <laughs> <laughs> and then talk to all of you um, that I think is maybe the most important theme um, of again, both presentations in Seattle as well as in San Francisco is this question of collaboration and what happens when we actually listen to and work collectively with black and indigenous femmes in particular, right? So um, Art25 um, and their project Future Ancestors is um, for me, one of the key works in the show that really help us as witnesses um, to this body of work, which is very vulnerable, right? They're sharing um, their bodies with a very public audience. Um, how can being in relationship to this work, which if you're seeing in person is larger than life, um, and listening to them, because there's a sound component as well as visual components, Right? How might that shift our attention? How might lingering here help shift our attention to really practice right, being with and listening to Black women, Indigenous women, non-binary uh, folks, right? as they tell their story, as they right, share with us um, their ways of living in the world in a very contemporary and future looking world right? that we would do well to listen to because we are in a time of crisis. Um, and curating their work as well as the work again of other artists like Super Futures Haunt Collective, 
um, who are thinking about animals and different right relations with animals and space um, in a non-didactic, in a poetic way, in a very public way, um, right? I think is um, not just meaningful to me, <laughs> um, but I think, right, uh, helps do something, right? Helps do something to shift our perceptions of not just art and who gets to make art, but also of what kind of space we who are queer, trans, brown, um, indigenous, the space that we're allowed to take, right? Um, and so even if it is a very unexpected um, journey, right? That we've went on to, again, turn around this show in two months um, from an indoor show to an outdoor and online show. Um, I think one of the unexpected gifts of that is the opportunity to have, in this case, an over six feet tall um, image of Angie Morell in her persona as a future ghost uh, haunting right across SF MoMA, which is right directly across the walkway from where she uh, is pointing. So I'm gonna scroll through some of these pretty quickly. And again, I'm sorry if I don't have the chance to talk in depth about some of these artists, but if anyone catches your eye in particular, and Julia Hanexis and I don't get to chat about them, please ask um, in the chat and would love to say a million more things about them. So I'm gonna stop the slideshow. We've gone through all of the artists. And yeah, happy to delve more specifically <laughs> into your good questions, Julia, whenever you have them for me. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I am so pleased to take this moment and um, they invited me in as sort of um, uh, uh, so that we would have an opportunity to discuss a couple of these projects more in depth. And then I have, I have some questions for you. And then I'm sure you have some questions even for the audience. You know, we, we are taking this moment um, and this format, <clears throat> excuse me, through Zoom to, um, to kind of try to uh, create more pathways through um, this medium and back into community. And we can see, for instance, like when I've attended artist lectures before, I'm like, how many people are in the room? I have no idea how many people are in the room. And so I just want to say that um, we have 109 attendees in the room. And we also have a huge collection of amazing people who are supporting us from behind the scenes. So, um, you know, Shaw, Osha creating this opportunity for us to have a conversation and then um, all of the people, um, all of the um, tech support that allows this to happen. Um, we also wanna um, thank all of you because without, without all of us being so flexible, you know, you talked about the artists um, having this um, trust in being able to achieve something through this extraordinary flexibility and in an extraordinarily unflexible moment. Um, and I think that we're also literally experiencing that through the attendance um, of these conversations today and in the coming weeks. So thanks for inviting me. And um, I, I'm just going to start with a question for you. Is yeah. that okay? Okay, great. Yes, you asked the best questions, Julia. <laughs> They're kind of meandering, but um, uh, but I'm so excited that we get to, t to talk. So, I mean, one thing that I one thing that I've noticed by looking at the works in this show and the way that um, it sort of evolved into this physically larger experience um, at YBCA, one one thing that I keep thinking about, and this may lead into um, the first. Uh, kind of project that we wanted to spend a little bit more time on, which was the uh, Courtney uh, Desiree Morris, the Soul Nostalgia project. But one thing that I keep noticing, um, and then this is, is of course because of where my head's at in the program, we're discussing this idea of protection mm -hmm. and how certain marine organisms use like protective features like shells to kind of like wrap around them or they borrow these things from each other to add protection in their environment or on their soft fleshy bodies. And so when I look at some of these works, I can't help but think about this idea of protection. Mm -hmm. 
And like particularly in the work of Courtney Desiree Morris, the this idea of protection as being um, uh, something that is happening through relationship and through this idea of mothering and also how uh, the, the work by being put up on the side of the building, um, the women are becoming like this protective element in an almost ar architectural way. They're protective of um, the city in a sense and they are protective of sort of um, uh, this this space that can no longer be accessed and I I'm just curious about what your thoughts are about um, how that how that protective element is working in those particular works and also in the in the works of um, uh, the Super Futures Hunt Collective that are um, on the exterior and the Art 25, like how, how the scale is affecting this um, presence of protection. And then, and then I have a follow-up question, which is, um, which is how, how this sense of mothering is related to your experience of curating. Ooh. I'm writing this down. This is so great. Um, and I love how your brain works. <laughs> so I'm going to try and do my best to kind of think, I'm um, thinking of like 30 million different things now. Um, and I'm going to pull up one image mm -hmm. if that's okay, just so folks can get uh, a little bit refreshed because I know I went through these pieces about um, to look at Courtney's, which is what you started off with. Can you all see that? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Whoops. I want to see your face. There you are. Um, so when you're talking about protection, I'm thinking about two things or a couple of things when it comes to Courtney Desiree Morris's work. And then you also brought up the Super Futures Hunt Collective, right? Who similarly, um, Courtney Desiree Morris's Art 25 and the Super Futures Hunt Collective, their work was all scaled up massively. Right? So they're photo-based, performance-based works um, that you know, we took advantage of YBCA's really weird <laughs> architecture, right? Um, and this, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's monstrous and gorgeous uh, in the way that it's designed. Um, but uh, you know, all of these works were scaled up massively. I should say Art 25s, the images of the three women in relation um, in this way was always meant to be six foot plus tall. Right, that's a really intentional part of their practice that their work is not for sale ever and that you are physically overwhelmed um, by the sight of these women in relation in ways that you might not be able to comprehend or understand. Um, but for Courtney's work, as well as for Super Futures, we are working on a much smaller scale, right? Many people have, including Courtney herself as the artist, um, have only ever seen her work in a more traditional like two by four, right? Um, I don't know that dimension. <laughs> wall hanging, small wall hanging size dimension of, of work. Um, but in all of those three pieces, Art 25, Super Futures Hunt Collective, and Courtney Desiree Morris, even if they're working um, on different themes, um, a couple of things are similar about them. One is the fact that we scaled them up. Another is that they are large images, very now large images of Black and Indigenous women, femmes, right, presenting folks. Um, and the other is that they're wearing masks of some kind, right? Or some kind of costuming or persona, which in a way is right, protective of them and their identities or their kind of embodying of a ghostly figure in some cases, right? Um, the Super Futures Hunt Collective present themselves as future, uh, future ghosts, right? That come back into the past, our present and haunt your ass <laughs> and make you think about, right? all of the anti-Indigenous, anti-Asian violence you have done, right? That you should maybe uh, be wary of. <laughs> um, there are sometimes vengeful ghosts, but also very funny ghosts. Um, and that's also in its way a protective armor, right? Of they're literally having visors in front of their faces. Um, meanwhile, in this image that Courtney Desiree Morris has, she's wearing a gas mask, so you can't actually see her face. And she's wearing a gas mask um, not just to take on a persona, although we can think of, you know, possible, right, um, kinds of dystopian Mad Max 
personas that are invoked when we see someone with a protective gas mask on, um, but she's actually doing that quite literally um, to mark this place, um, which is in Louisiana that has been taken over. It's a black community, a freedman's community that's been taken over by oil, oil rigs, right? From South Africa and other multinationals that have literally destroyed this place um, due to drilling and fracking um, and buying up all of the land. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but one thing I'm thinking about is protection on that scale, right? Um, these, again, Black and Indigenous femmes are protecting themselves, putting on armor of these different personas um, to reflect outwards to all of us who are seeing their work at a very large scale, right? These different kinds of levels of violence on land, violence on communities of color, um, violence on Indigenous um, relations, violence on animals even because Super Futures is playing with a story in this show about uh, beavers that were literally dropped out of planes um, to repopulate um, in Eastern, um, in Idaho, <laughs> and who died, some of whom died in the process of being dropped out of planes in Idaho. Um, but at the same time, even if they're wearing these protective mechanisms, and this is the second thing that I'm thinking about when you're talking, Julia, um, is that they're being incredibly vulnerable while masked uh, in showing themselves, right? And showing and turning inside out, um, right? Really intimate stories and intimate relations for public consumption. And maybe this ties into this question of, of care work, right? Um, and anyone can be a mother. You don't have to be, right? A cis woman to be a mother. But all of these, um, or these particular projects, I think are performing a kind of care labor um, in terms of trying to model for us what right relation would look like. So on one hand, right, if we're seeing state violence such as dropping beavers out of planes, um, which is what happened in the 40s and 50s in Idaho, right? Um, because the government decided that they wanted more dams in another part of the state and there were too many beavers in another, right? Um, if the work is on one hand showing that kind of violence, it's also showing us an antidote in some ways, right? Other, other ways of loving and of being um, in relation that aren't predicated on those founding really colonial um, kinds of violence. Um, and I really love what you said and I don't have an answer for it, but I'm definitely gonna keep thinking about this is, um, right, how does the fact that they've been scaled so large, right? Kind of provide a protective skin <laughs> not just over the building, because it's literally covering windows and um, other exterior features, um, but also in terms of maybe being, um, and I don't want to say this, to make it sound like indigenous women are totems, that's not what I'm trying to say, um, but having their large images, right, kind of being guardians of sort, of a space that um, is not abandoned, uh, but is certainly less used. And I actually really love this image because it shows that the space isn't abandoned um, and that every day still now with masks, um, the same groups of older, crustier, grumpy Filipino American um, men always gather outside to play chess. Um, and they will do that till the end of time, at least I hope so. Um, and they, I mean, are there. <laughs> being watched over um, and being held by right, um, the women uh, who, are, who are behind them. And I think that's really, again, in both those senses, the actual folks that are reclaiming space and taking up space, <laughs> as well as the images of um, Black femmes who take up space in their own respective right places. I think both of that actually um, really powerfully captures this work of, of survivance. Oh, and curation. Yeah, curation's like mothering. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't answer that question, but I do think of the work that you've done too, Julia, um, in terms of what we did at the Alice, right? Which is so much about sometimes, I mean, I'm thinking of you carrying through a winch, uh, concrete, uh, <laughs> one ton sculpture, um, but why you did that? Right, because you really wanted to support the work of um, of Jean Medina, and that relationship um, led you to an incredible, an incredible <laughs> feat of engineering that I will never understand. 
Yeah, I mean, well, it's caretaking with uh, some wicked problem solving, right? Yeah. And and I think that that's part of the, like the collective nature of the Alice Gallery allowed us to do more than we could have done as individuals or even would have done. Yeah. Um, like most of these um, projects that I sort of like got to support through, you know, like knowing how to build shelves or like an understanding that we could probably get a 300 pound sculpture up a flight of stairs, you know, like all of these sort of, um, uh, you bring all of yourself to the projects, but then also um, the whole point is that you are, um, you're just what what is like sort of underneath um, because you're really working for you're working for the artists. So like, you know, I remember multiple instances in shows throughout um, the time that we worked together there uh, where um, like the thing would not have existed if the show would not have existed. So the expression or the idea was already, the artist had already done all of that, but it wouldn't have its fully realized form without the space that was created by the gallery or by working with this um, institution. And I think too, like, um, thanks for those answers to those questions. I, um, oh, I, I should remind you um, to all the attendees that there's still gonna be a Q and A. So this is sort of like an intermediary, but your questions, um, you can type them into the Q and A or ask them um, during like the last 25 minutes or so, um, depending on when we um, sort of conclude. But, but as you were talking, I was sort of, um, I, I couldn't help but also think about the relationship with um, institutions or the relationship with, you know, you were mentioning um, with this incredible story about the um, artificial and violent moving of um, beaver populations, right? How that, um, how that sort of um, artificiality of the movement of organisms and the movement of um, uh, of, of, of human peoples in relation to their environment, like um, how that relates to these ideas, these kind of core ideas of like place and space and time. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the thing, as you were talking throughout this, um, throughout this talk, the thing that I kept thinking about was um, uh, like, what do things look like um, each day now? Because I feel like, you know, when you, when you said in the beginning of the talk, um, what does, you know, this idea of what does change look like? I don't know what change looks like. I don't know what progress looks like. And I feel like that question um, is occurring through time differently right now. So it's like, what does it look like now? And what does it look like now? And what does it look like now? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder mm -hmm. um, if you could talk a little bit about um, more generally the idea of shifting, shifting mm -hmm. as humans through space, shifting as art through space, mm -hmm. um, or shifting the art of artists through space and how that is also has a relationship to um, through time. Could, could you talk about time and space? <laughs> sure. <laughs> in, in, in all practical senses too, right? Like also just the labor that it takes to shift art ideas um, and, sh you know, shift things into place. Yes. What does that look like? Yeah. And then how to do it in a way that isn't like some disembodied thing. Yeah. And I can talk a little bit you're giving me so much, my brain is exploding. Um, and I'm gonna, I guess, I think I'm gonna answer in this way that maybe folds in some of this question around curation and caring for and what that looks like um, to a specific example of what we've had to learn. And by we, I mean myself, the artists, as well as the institution itself, because I have a great team of um, folks at YBCA, right, who are full-time staff, um, about three or four folks like Martin Strickland, who's the director of public life at YBCA, who have really um, held the show 
on the institutional side, but all of us are learning because this is uncharted territory, right? YBCA has never done an online only exhibition or public art exhibition like this. Um, and I certainly, there's no training school <laughs> for how to curate in a pandemic. Uh, if there is, I would still not want to sign up because that sounds awful. But uh, <laughs> specifically when, it, when I'm thinking about curation and care and being attentive to place, um, for a show like this, both at the Alice and at the Yerba Buena Center, it was really important to bring in local artists as well as, you know, artists cited in different places, even, you know, globally, who could indirectly, not didactically, not in a luxury way, but I thought, you know, who could poetically, right, speak to issues that resonated in the community where it was cited. So in San Francisco, like many other cities, thinking of Seattle, Seattle's not too different in San Francisco. I don't know how Olympia is doing these days, but I'm sure there's similar problems <laughs> there with things like gentrification, over-policing, right? Um, with um, forms of natural and unnatural disaster, like you know, we now have wildfire season, right? Every summer, thinking of work like Misha Cardenas's video game that I mentioned, which is of a trans Latinx um, avatar of her uh, uh, navigating wildfires, right? Um, and she made that, I should say, while she was faculty. We we're both faculty at Utah Bothell. We lived through that summer of wildfires in the Pacific Northwest in 2017. That's when she first created that piece, or 2018, I should say. Um, and then just before this show opened here in San Francisco, we already knew we were going to be projecting it, but Misha wasn't able to refilm parts of it because she was evacuating her home in Santa Cruz, where she now lives. She's now faculty at UC Santa Cruz by new wildfires. So that piece almost didn't come up, right? In the site-specific iteration because she literally was escaping the very thing that she made the game around, wildfires. Um, so going back to this question of curation and what it means to care for in this time of pandemic, how do we live different ethics and how do we do place-based work in a time where everything seems really disembodied because we all live on Zoom? Um, I'm thinking of the work of curating coven intelligence program, which is a techno botanical coven. As they say, their three members are cited all over the world. One uh, is between the France and is now back in San Francisco because she's binational. Um, another member is in upstate New York and another member is in Pittsburgh, but they do come together specifically through the internet, right? They are techno botanical coven after all. Um, to creating spells and other literal uh, witch work um, around the places that they live, right? And they invite people to rethink differently their relationship to healing and harming plants um, and to conjure up um, and to learn about the plant life in your place, um, how they got there, whether they're invasive or native to place, um, and how we can work with them, not in a colonial way to sell them or to patent them, um, but to aid us in our own radical um, work to disrupt, in particular, um, algorithms to disrupt AI and surveillance tech. So they um, created this online app that, again, feels really disembodied, but invites folks to call in a plant and a machine and an ally um, of your choosing related to your place to, to craft a spell that you can hopefully actually then use, um, at least to inspire you at the very least, <laughs> if not, you know, uh, overthrow the machine, but at least inspire you, right, to, to think differently about your relationship to, to plants and to, um, yeah, machines of all kinds, including toaster ovens and vibrators. Uh, in your own journey, right, for, for radical change. And I'll show just, I know we have like one minute left, but I just want to show an example of how we tried to do this. Um, and maybe it's not so innovative, but I have not been to an online spell casting workshop. Uh, but I thought this one was really powerful, actually. Because <laughs> it was, you know, a YouTube call similar to this format. People weren't able to interact except in the chat, but the chat was hyperactive. Uh, I was, you know, curator and generator of, of chat things to keep that going while the artists themselves um, ran the spell, again, located in three different places with a live feed of an altar um, that one of them uh, had made in a real 
space right, with real plants in real time. Um, and it was a really, I think, beautiful example of um, the kind of work that we're all called to do now, which is unfortunately, unfortunately, to be more flexible and to rethink our own relationships, both across distance and also really rooted to the place that we're in. So I'll just show a really quick kind of one minute clip so you can see um, a little bit of what the online spell workshop did. And again, I'm really happy to just had, had a chance to, to process some of this with you because it's still ongoing, Julia. Um, and again, to share with, with everyone on the, on the webinar now, um, some work by artists that I think everyone should be listening to and thinking alongside with. So I'll just share this really quick clip. We also want to um, call in plants. And we live in a culture of uh, heroes where we put the strong, the powerful, the successful, the rich, the, 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 the eloquent at center. And we do so with all the organisms that we select to surround us, like the most spectacular and scented flower, the most drought resistant rice, the most fruitful fruit tree, the most uh, fast growing chicken, et cetera. We've completely altered our surroundings and we'd like to call on the relatives of of those species that surround us the ones that have remained wild the ones that have escaped capitalism we want to call them in as allies to build our spells and i'll just fast forward so you can just see what the interface looked like really quickly um this was wild because they were writing a spell in real time while people were typing in the chat different uh, words, right? <laughs> that they were, you know, um, yeah, they were prompted to uh, share their favorite plants that they wanted to call in their favorite um, machine allies. And on the spot, the artists uh, modeled what it would be like to, to write a spell. And um, so and, you know, keep that going. So in, in, in as your allies or your accomplices, you know, you can think of plants, animal, witches, and we mentioned also machines. Maybe you're not used to thinking of machines as your accomplice because right now machines are usually used against us, but always remember that machines can be hacked. In, as, in, in our cosmology, actually, witches help us to hack machines and make machines uh, our accomplices towards the revolution. So if you are thinking of machines that you like, they would like to be hacked, like uh, Margareta was talking about satellites um, or Susan about the recording devices, then go ahead and also tell, tell us about your your machine um, familiars. Hey, do you think we could use those, those machines that cut all those trees like in one minute? Do you think we could hack those to have them cut, I don't know, wires <laughs> or something? Hell like yeah. So I'll stop right there. They ended up making a spell, again, collaboratively co-generated by folks who were typing furiously in the chat. Um, and they also, and they still do. So if you go on the ybca.org website, um, you can still submit your own spell, um, which you get an algorithm yourself for a weaving pattern and a rhizome um, that you also add to their online spell database, which hopefully, right, uh, shows collectively, right, the power of witchcraft and, and magical thinking to making real change in this case against um, the capitalocene and the plantationocene. So I'll end with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. And um, one project that we had talked about ta uh, um, touching on that we're not going to have a chance in order to open it up for Q&A, but of course, if Q&A sort of like resolves, we can come back to it. But one, um, one project that I've just um, dropped a couple of links into the chat for, um, for everyone that's attending today is um, this 50-50 um, collective portable memories um, in rising seas project. And through interacting with that project, I think you all will understand um, sort of what it is that they're trying to do with that particular project, which entwines um, uh, ecological catastrophe, the rising seas with um, 
personal memories and sort of creating a compendium of, uh, of knowledge about climate change that is based in memory. Um, so the second link, the 5050artcollective.com, um, please go there and participate by contributing um, uh, uh, a memory that you have um, through that particular portal. Um, and with that, I think um, we can open it up to Q&A and uh, Shaw, I think we'll come back in to sort of facilitate um, the official Q&A series. So thank you so much. And um, I can't wait to hear what the rest um, of uh, those of us that have been listening to you today have questions about. Yeah, and thanks for sharing that bit about 50-50. So the thing that they're asking folks to submit are images like this one that's right behind me. That was from a previous iteration of your memories of, of the sea and of sea change um, at a very personal level. So those of you, especially the art folks and the marine biology interested folks in the room, might be really keen on that project. Nice. Thank you so much, Thea, and thank you, Julia for um, starting a conversation. We already, we have one hand up, um, Mark Lambro from very early on. Mark, do you want to unmute yourself? So the way this will go is that there's, you can either ask a question through raising, by raising your virtual hand, and then we get to hear your voice, which is we encourage because the closer we can get to in our Q&A chat and then we will read them as they come up. So, uh, Mark, do you want to? Hello? There you go. Okay. Uh, just wanted to say hi to Julia. I was uh, with her class um, my first quarter and it was really nice to see them again. And it's really cool to like see the connection between uh, Thea and I just like you to sit. I'm my brain's dying. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Mine is too. Right. It's hard to keep attention on this online life. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's nice to hear your yeah. work, Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, were there any particular artists you were drawn to or one that I can riff off of? Or I can just keep talking about how amazing Julia is. I'm always happy to be part of the Julia Hanexus fan club. Um, yeah. We can stop that though. But um, <laughs> I see um, there are some questions in the, in the Q&A chat as well. Um, Shot, sure. should, um, how, how best to facilitate that? Should I read it out loud? Sure, and you could, um, one of the things you talked about is if there's overlap, a way of make, maybe thinking about these questions as one or, or not. Um, so yeah, sure. Okay, great. Well, so um, uh, one question that's being posed is about um, storefronts. So, and this is, this is a question from Ren. A lot of storefronts um, that have been closed during um, COVID-19 have boarded up their windows and that has become a strange new canvas for semi-temporary murals. Um, and so the way that you've chosen to um, uh, display the San Francisco show feels uh, very reminiscent of that to me. Um, was that something that you were thinking about or was that deliberate? So that's one question and then I'll, I'll bundle. There's a question um, um, from uh, Nene or Nini. Um, it's a, uh, more of a comment um, uh, bringing to uh, the conversation that as an interdisciplinary artist who does both digital work alongside, alongside oils and gouache, um, she just wants to say thank you so much for curating as broadly as you do. So yeah, maybe um, speak yeah. to the specificity and the sort of um, current reality of uh, places being boarded up and art being on, on top of that. And then also maybe the breadth of your curation. Yeah, happy to chat about that. Um, and I'll pull up one project, which I didn't and I might not have a chance to talk about specifically, but just as a kind of place, not a placeholder, but yeah. I like thinking alongside the work of artists directly. Um, so to, you know, to that question that Ren has about uh, 
you know, storefronts and images, I'm thinking about a couple of things. Um, and, you know, one was in Seattle, at least, where we, I'm looking at Julia here, as I say we, uh, where we were at the beginning of the summer in about May or June or so, I'm thinking of the chop, right? And all of the really powerful and incredible murals to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, and makeshift memorials, right? With candles um, and other things that got put up around the chop um, before, right? Um, it was violently, and while it was being violently assaulted by uh, Seattle PD, right? And the function that those works uh, do and did uh, to, right? Sparking outrage as well as grief over, right? Ongoing atrocities against black folks um, in Seattle specifically and in the larger US context. Um, and in some ways, some of these projects in this show very intentionally do function as memorial. And there was a particular way of curating it where I wanted that um, for people encountering the work to, to think about it as such, right? I and mean, what you're seeing here, if you're seeing some weird dots, it's because there is an online 3D walkthrough that's kind of disorienting and amazing at the same time. And these are screenshots from the fully 3D walkthrough, right? So those dots are like places you can click for more information. And what you're seeing here are two things. Um, one on the right is by Alejandro Asierto. This is kind of a new media memorial in some ways um, to Sylvia Rivera, uh, a trans Latinx activist, uh, badass, amazing femme. Uh, and her speech is being played on the monitor. Y'all better listen, which is calling out cis gay men at the 1973 uh, gay liberation rally um, for ignoring right the voices of trans women of color. 1973, still happening, yeah? And right above it is that neon triangle um, invoking act up, silence equals death. Um, and in that space where you can actually hear because there's exterior monitors, um, you can hear the sounds of Sylvia Rivera's speech that's kind of glitchy because the frame only moves forward as long as people on Twitter are tweeting with the LGBTQ hashtag. So if no one's doing online activism, it's silence. Uh, and if there's a lot of folks, then it moves forward at a normal frame rate. Um, so in that way, right, it's a new media kind of monument. Um, and I wanted people to apprehend it as such. This piece on the left that's kind of getting cut off, that's a really large um, car, not cardboard, plywood, <laughs> uh, like 20 foot, 25 foot tall board. I'm sorry, it's cut off there. That's actually not part of the show, but I think it's important to bring up too as something, another public art project that lives alongside the show. It's facilitated by the artist and cura creator, cura co curator, curator, Caleb Duarte. <laughs> called a monument. Um, it's a living monument, so it changes every week, and it's meant to right, shift what we think of as public mural and public monuments, because uh, different artists, in response to what's happening um, at every two weeks, uh, will we'll reinvigorate and reshape that, and in some ways, um, it's calling on that tradition of, uh, you know, mural as memorial and as a bulletin board for outrage um, and also playing with this idea of who can take up public art in uh, an art institution. So to answer the question in a long about way, yes, thinking about memorial, thinking about how we shift our idea of memorial um, and the medium and maybe that ties into the second comment, which is, uh, yeah, I wanted to move beyond, uh, beyond and with, right? Uh, different forms of media and always do um, because I think that there's no paintings in this show unfortunately they were supposed to be by super features but we had to move everything outside so their piece uh, ended up looking very different um, but it is really important for me to curate artists who are working across diverse media or even virtual media I've been sitting in front of one of Jeremiah Barber's totally online virtual uh, artwork rooms um, I think it's really important to do that, right? To help shift the conversation about who can make art and what does art look like. I'm just rambling. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it looks like uh, Suri, um, if uh, Suri could be, oh yeah, thank you. 
Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for your awesome um, lecture. I think it's very timely and feels like very inspiring and optimistic to just see the work that you're creating in community in a very authentic way. So I'm speaking from a vantage of being faculty teaching advanced programs, as well as media interns that are running the show right now. So good job, students. Um, but as we look to support like the final shows and capstone work of our students in winter and spring quarter, I'm wondering if you could share either any of the institutional hurdles that you had to overcome in San Francisco, particularly in that time frame, And then if you also have any tips for us who are wanting to like get our work out in, into public while our campus is closed yeah. and um, you know, I guess the question would be, are you doing that at your university and or is it just better for us to go into the world with our work or like working within the institutional structure? Yeah, thank you for those really important and really practical and timely questions, right, about what does it mean in this context and period, right? Because even if we aren't in pandemic, so many artists, student artists, emerging artists, artists of all, right, uh, places in, in our careers, um, there's fewer and fewer places to show, right? And institutional precarity and individual precarity is so intense and so real. Um, so I really appreciate this question. Um, in terms of institutional hurdles, I mean, that is one thing that um, really felt and was very different in moving the show from the Alice, which again, it's like the hurdle there is money. Money, it's not anything else. We had each other and it was very much a mutual aid right, model of lifting each other up and lifting up artists, right? So if we were able to get external grants, which I was able to for four, from Four Culture to help put on that first show at the Alice, which was incredibly amazing and helpful um, to compensating the artists mostly uh, as they deserve to be. Um, but there wasn't anything lacking in terms of labor because it was, it was care work. It was care labor of mounting an independent show. Um, institutionally the YBCA, it's the inverse problem, right? They throw money, not throw money, it's not like so much money, but they have money to offer and they do have space, which is incredible. Um, but some of the key pieces, which is, you know, a belief in the artists and the work that we're doing, right? And in some cases, an understanding of why these works, again, primarily made by BIPOC queer and trans artists, yet don't always read as overtly political work. Um, a work that can be easily commodified, right? Many of the artists like Art25 refuse to sell their work, right? Um, it can be hard to shift institutional models, which are very much corporate models, um, to, to getting behind an idea like that, unless it does one of two things. Unless one, it's really commercially viable work determined by who knows what, <laughs> art markets or whatever. Um, or work that is really legibly able to be commodified as protest art, frankly, protest art or political art. And this show, I don't think trades in that intentionally, right? Or does that, I hope it helps people think um, differently, right? And it opens minds in particular ways and really uh, intentional anti-racist um, and queer ways, um, but isn't commodifiable in a way that this particular institution could understand, even though, right? Um, it doesn't sell, uh, it's not a commercial gallery, but it is an institution that trades on diversity um, in particular ways. So that's all to say, it's maybe a, sorry if I'm speaking obliquely, but the show's still up. I hope they still like me. Um, it can be hard. It can be hard to really get people to put in, or institutions I should say, to put in the care labor of what it really means to supporting the work of artists, right? Um, beyond giving them a space um, on the wall. Um, and so that is where I think a curator, if anything, that's where I can be useful. So one is for artists, student artists, when working with curators, make sure they don't screw you. I don't know how better to say that, um, but it's really important to have a curator that is on your side and can really hear you um, and listen to you when you say what the project is about. I think um, that's something really important for folks working young artists working and wanting to get into the art biz <laughs> is, you know, if you are working with a curator, um, please make sure they listen and demand that they do and leave if they don't. Um, 
I know it can be hard to, to say that, but that's the only way your work will have integrity. <laughs> no matter what scale you're showing in. And then in terms of exhibition strategy, so some practical things um, in front of, behind me is Jeremiah Barber who created a fully virtual um, exhibition um, using this software and I'm forgetting the name of it now and I'm so sorry. So I can send it on to Shaw and to Julia so they can send it to folks if they're interested. But it was a free program. I think it's like a $13 a year thing to host if you have um, a university license. So you can make your own digital gallery space. And this one is, again, it's in VR. So if you have VR glasses, you can literally walk through the space um, and it's interactive. And if you go to uh, the YBCA website for the show and you look up Jeremiah's Barber's work, right? Um, you can go with that interface. And this actually was a really ingenious way, I think, of presenting his work, which was in progress, right? Um, maybe not necessarily ready to uh, put into the physical exhibition, but that can very much be built out for a very professional looking uh, virtual exhibition space in a way that's, I think, much more dynamic um, and interesting than um, a simple slideshow, right, of still images. This allows you to actually embed um, videos and, and other things, which I'm pointing the wrong way, which is why there's a cat on the table, right? <laughs> <laughs> he ends up sharing a story and a video of a cat eating one of his artworks. Um, that again is part of the process and also part of um, the, edu uh, the exhibition strategy that he was working with that would not have been actually possible to do in real time. So I would suggest, I think for artists wanting to show their work, student artists too, that there can be some really low cost um, and low barrier to entry ways of dynamic presentation um, in 3D, at least virtual space that I think is actually super interesting um, as a possibility. Um, and then in terms of kind of other exhibition strategies, I mean, I, I wish I had a better answer, sorry. Like this is one of the scary things about this moment, right? Is that there are galleries that are open for walk-in appointment, which can be risky, but also those galleries at this moment that I'm noticing are tending to support artists that already have more of an established name, right? Because those galleries too are thinking about their bottom line um, as they, I guess, need to um, at this moment to, to sell some work. And so I would, you know, I would say, you know, as much as is possible for students, if they're able to begin forging connections and genuine ones, not just predatory ones on either side, genuine connections with artist run space. I'm thinking in Seattle of Wanawari, which is really an incredible space. Um, uh, you know, visiting them, building those relationships as much as possible, even virtually talking to the different artists and curators who are really committed um, to ethical curation and showing of work. Um, and, you know, there's no guarantee that anything will come out of it, but at the very least, right? A different kind of relationship can be forged um, and a kind of mutual aid, <laughs> really, truly a kind of mutual aid could be forged by building those genuine relationships. So I don't know, those would be the two things I, I would say. Thank you, that was great, appreciate it. Thanks for all these questions. I, um, uh, the next um, person that I saw um, with a hand up, and uh, I'm not certain whether they're still in the room, but um, Jace, uh, if you have a question, um, you might be able to unmute yourself or we can unmute for you. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. My question was actually answered already. Oh, great. <laughs> Nice hearing your voice. <laughs> yeah, I saw two questions in the q and I finally figured out how to turn on that button. <laughs> from Paul and then from Nico. Should I answer those, Julia? Oh, yeah. Yeah, can you? Um, and then we have one um, uh, that is reiterated by Shaw in the chat, um, uh, which I, I can follow up with. Um, sure. In combination with these, so the the one that um, uh, that Shaw has um, sent over to me is that 
um, for you to just uh, uh, address um, terms like poetic and didactic okay. and to expand on what it means to refuse to trade in diversity, protest art, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe to bundle it, Paul's question, thank you so much for um, recognizing the really challenging effort of mounting the show. And they said, oh, it feels like a metaphor for what your faculty and staff at Evergreen did at the start of the pandemic to transform our programs to online. So yes, thank you, Julia and Shaw and Suri and all the faculty at Evergreen for all of your work. So that was a nice shout out for you all. And then Nico asked if I have any perspective in regards to moving forward into and through the current landscape of catastrophe holding on to imagination and collaboration as possible and integral to survivance for POC, um, queer and marginalized identity. And thanks so much for that question, Nico, because it's like, I think the big one, right? Like outside of the space of this particular show um, and what I'm speaking about specifically, I think all of us in this room are rightly, right? I think wanting to be really hopeful and also recognizing that we are really in some deep crap, <laughs> right? With the events of last week, um, fresh on our minds, right? Um, and an upcoming, uh, hopefully not so horrendous uh, inauguration, right? Like what does it mean to actually try and hold on to hope <laughs> in what seems like super dark times? Um, I don't have necessarily advice except to say mutual aid. We will only get through this if we do it not alone. Um, like, and I mean that really deeply. Um, I don't think I knew what it meant to work collaboratively as an artist or as a writer um, until I joined the Alice and was invited um, by its founder, Julia Freeman, to join the group uh, along with folks like Julia Henexius and other artists and curators. Before that, you know, we are so trained as academics, as students, um, as scholars, as people, right, to work alone, right, to fight for ourselves and our dreams and our desires and our cash um, in a really siloed way. And it's really hard, as you all well know, right, to actually do that, right? It's impossible. Um, and so, in terms of advice and thinking about utopia, I think now is the time to really call on your own inner resources and also call on the resources of others that are able to share them and think about ways, really think and talk about ways collaboratively of how to make it through this time together. So the time at the Alice was really important for that. Of literally, we can't put the show up unless Julia Henexis builds some shelves. The art will literally not go on the wall because I cannot build anything for anything. That is not, I can't do that. But Julia Henexius can. <laughs> so sometimes it's really literal. And sometimes it's also like I, for myself as a non-Indigenous person, it's like, yeah, what are Indigenous femmes thinking about? I don't know. I'm not one. I'm not going to pretend to speak for one or be one. That's messed up. You know, how can I actually be in conversation and listen? And listen in a way where our collective right desire to show work back to this question of poetic versus didactic right that is in that case with art 25 literally incorporating poetry and poetic text and spoken word um, but also right thinking i would say um, more metaphorically or more uh, speculatively about solutions rather than didactic or prescriptive ways of telling you right what you should think or how you should live um i think you know actually being in relation right and working intimately and closely with these artists um was the only way one for that show to happen because actual trust had to be forged right between us already before we even get to a point of then turning around a show in two months that did something like this. Um, and it's also the only way that 
we as artists of color and indigenous artists are gonna get our work up on the walls. The old boys network, which is rapidly crumbling, thank goodness, is still in place, right? So if we're not able to look out for one another and think through right, different strategies of kicking down the doors collectively, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and so in terms of the advice, <laughs> I just said I don't like didactics, but I, maybe this is semi-prescriptive. Uh, I would say now is the time for real mutual aid and, and for looking out for one another. So thanks all for coming uh, and for letting me ramble at you all for a little while. And I do hope you have a healthy and as joyful as possible um, semester at, at Evergreen. Thank, thank you, so thank much. you so much. Oh, go ahead, Cho. Saying the same, thank you for coming and being with us for this hour and a half. We hope to have you back in person. Yeah. Yeah. I would love that, and I miss it up there. It's so beautiful mm -hmm. in Washington. Oh, God. It's a little rainy, so. <laughs> I heard, I'm sorry, I hope no one lost power. <laughs> um, but otherwise, it's so beautiful. Invite me in summer Great. or in spring. Okay, all right. <laughs> Well, thank you both. Thank you, Thea. Um, take care, everyone.